Okay, good evening everyone. Let's get started again. So last week we talked about epithelia and hopefully in the labs you guys found that cells were really, really small and hopefully also saw some epithelia themselves and epithelial cells. But again, if you didn't, it's okay because you will be looking at epithelia for the rest of the semester. On every slide you will look at, there will be an epithelium somewhere. Okay, so plenty more opportunities to look for them. Now, today what I want to talk about is connective tissue, which as the name implies is basically the kind of tissue that is used to attach things to other things. The main one being what we talked about last week, epithelium. If you have an epithelium, what's underneath it is going to be connective tissue. That's going to be always the case, one way or another, regardless of how thin that, that connective tissue is, it's going to be there attaching it to other things. Okay. Now, last week we talked about the fact that epithelial cells have a basement membrane. And I think I mentioned also that muscle cells, for example, also have basal lamina, this kind of an outer coating. So you can think of connective tissue as everything in between two basement membranes or basal lamina. Okay. Basically, it's the stuff that interconnects and fills in the spaces in between epithelium and other parts or other tissues. So basically we're going to be talking about everything that happens down in this area here. Okay, so this is all going to be connective tissue. Now there's many different types of connective tissue and so we will be going over them over the next couple of weeks. It will take some time because connective tissues have a variety of different functions. And so you might think, okay, couldn't the scientists have just decided, okay, let's just, instead of going with four basic tissues, decide, okay, let's go with ten, make our lives easier, and say epithelium, this type of tissue, this type of tissue, this type of tissue, muscle, something else, something else. Um, they decided to go with four. Seems simpler like that, that way at the time. Um, and so what we have is basically kind of a category of tissues that responsible for structural support, things like bones, tendons, ligaments. These are all connective tissues. Uh, there are some that facilitate exchange of substances, so allow for easy diffusion. Okay. So extracellular matrix in, for example, your small intestines um, are going to have this very loose connective tissue which allows for very easy diffusion. It's very hydrated uh, and allows for very easy movement of molecules across. Uh, your blood is also a connective tissue. Seems a little odd to have blood and bones and cartilage in the same general category, but it is. Okay, uh, storage of energy, adipose tissue is also a connective tissue. Um, protection, so your immune response is done by components of connective tissue. Your immune system is a, is a connective tissue. Okay? Um, adipose tissue again falls into that category. Okay, you don't believe me? Adipose tissue is responsible for protection. Sorry? Get the volume up? Okay. I can try moving it up a little bit. Is that better? Okay, let's try it this way. People who are listening to this at home, you're about to hear something a lot louder. Okay, is that better? Okay. All right, so adipose tissue is under protection as well. How do we know adipose tissue is under protection? It's storage of energy. What else is the function of adipose tissue? Well, if you don't believe me that adipose tissue protects you, punch in the, well, no. Have the person next to you punch you in the shoulder uh, and see how much damage that does. Well, not too hard. Uh, but see how much damage that does, okay? We are surrounded by this outer covering of pockets of adipose tissue that are there as shock absorbers, okay? They are there to protect us as well, not just uh, energy storage. Um, and again, repair. Um, connective tissue takes care of healing your wounds, for example. So um, once you puncture the epithelium, the epithelium can regenerate itself fairly easily, but underneath that epithelium, you still need to be able to heal the actual connective tissues underneath as well. Now, depending on how the damage occurs and how extensive it is, you either leave a lot of scarring or you don't. And again, that happens because of this repair process, which is done by specific types of connective tissues. So a variety of different 
categories or functions, and it's all connective tissue. So what do they have in common? Why are they all categorized, lumped into this one general category? Well, the one thing that scientists have decided that, OK, if there is a category that we're going to put these into, they have to have some sort of something in common. And what they have in common is the fact that they are fairly acellular. Okay, the major component of connective tissue is the extracellular matrix and not the cells. Okay? So this is not a, a tissue that is com composed of lots of cells connected to one another. We have our individual cells spread throughout, and in between them, lots and lots of actual ECM. Okay? So we have abundant extracellular matrix, and we have relatively few cells. Again, it differs how frequent they are depends on the kind of tissue you're looking at. But again, as a definition of connective tissue, this is it. Okay? The fact that the major component is the ECM and not the cells. Question? So, is blood plasma considered Yes, the plasma, blood plasma is considered the ECM, and 55% of blood is plasma, which is why blood is, again, qualifies as a connective tissue. Okay? Now, the cells that we do have. There's many different types, and we will be looking at many of them in this course um, over the next couple of weeks. Uh, but they won't all be in the same type of tissue at the same time. So again, when you are looking at different types of tissues, what kind of cells you see there will depend on the type of tissue you're looking at. So again, when you are in a test situation, I show you a picture or a slide of something, figure out what the whole thing is. Once you know that, you can narrow down the number of different cells they might find there, and then it's fairly easy to figure out which cell type I might be pointing at. Okay? So don't expect to see you know, all, you know, whatever, 30 cell types on every single slide. There will be two or three specific tissue, uh, sorry, cells that might be found on one particular tissue type. Okay? So again, don't freak out just because you're supposed to know, you know 10 or 20 different cells in connective tissues. They're not all going to be in the same spot. Okay, so again, as we're going through the tissue types, I will point out which ones you're likely to see there, which ones you're not likely to see there, okay? and what other characteristics you can look for to help you identify a particular tissue type. So again, just going back to the cells, the cells themselves can be subdivided further into fixed cells and wandering cells. Uh, you won't actually see them wandering around on your slides because they're all, at that point, fixed, um, if you think about slide preparation. but um, if we think about it, what's going on in the body, there are some cell types that will simply be there to produce the matrix, um, to just basically be there and, and monitor the matrix to make sure that everything's going on there, to, to make sure there are no pathogens. And then there will be some which are mostly associated with the immune system, which will kind of come in and out of the tissue. They will wander around. Uh, they will periodically come into the tissue, and then they will leave. Okay. Now, again, the main component here will be the ECM. So that's what I will spend most of my time for the next probably half hour or so talking about. So let's talk about the um, extracellular matrix. Um, the matrix itself is subdivided into two main components. There are the fibers, and then there's something called the ground substance. Let me just make sure that so the fibers first. The fibers are mostly collagen. As I mentioned last lecture, there are over 20 different types of collagen. Don't worry, you don't have to know all of them. There are five main types, four or five, depending on who you ask. And that's really what you're going to need to really be able to identify, not identify, but know about. Okay? So they are called type 1, type 2, type 3, type 4, type 5, etc. Okay? So pretty easy. Now, type 1 collagen is the main one, so that's the one I want you guys to really understand. About 90% of collagen is type 1 collagen. And it is found pretty much everywhere in your body. I mean everywhere. It's inside your eyeball. It makes up the cornea. It makes up the sclera of your eye. Okay. 
It's found in your dermis, so underneath the epithelium of your skin. In the dermis, the main component there is type 1 collagen. It's found inside your teeth. Yes, it's found inside your teeth as well. It's found inside your bones. Okay? Pretty much any part of your body will have type 1 collagen there. Okay? A major proportion of dry weight of your body is collagen. Okay, now what is collagen? Um, collagen is basically a protein. Uh, your cells produce this, specifically cells called fibroblasts, which we'll be briefly mentioning later today. So fibroblasts. Produce collagen. As well as a variety of other substances, but collagen. And Again, I'm talking about collagen in general. All of it applies to type 1 collagen. And the other types of collagens are going to differ slightly from this general description. So collagen is a protein which is composed of basically a repeating sort of sequence of amino acids, mostly glycine. Proline, lysine, now nothing special about it so far, okay. but this protein is initially produced inside the cell, and it's actually modified within the rough ER. So most proteins are actually modified in the Golgi apparatus. But collagen is unique in that it's actually modified post-translationally within the rough ER. And is modified such that proline and lysine are hydroxylated. So they become hydroxyproline. And hydroxy. Lysine. Again, it just sounds like I'm throwing a whole bunch of technical jargon at you. But this hydroxylation is important. Because this hydroxylation allows for these relatively short collagen fibrils, which actually are um, basically triple helices. So it's basically one triple collagen, two, and three, forming one longer fiber, which is going to be um, basically shipped out of the cell or transported to the outside of the cell. And basically what's going to happen is this hydroxylation will allow for cross-linking of neighboring fibers. So you can have the formation of these very long fibers because we have cross links being formed between them through these hydroxyproline hydroxylysine residues. This allows for the formation of very long and very, very strong fibers. Okay? Collagen has a very high tensile strength. What does that mean? Tensile strength means that if you pull on it on both ends, it's going to resist that tension. Okay. Basically, you can think of collagen as a rope. Okay. Now, just like a rope, the more of these individual fibers you have linked into it, the thicker the collagen bundle becomes and the stronger the rope becomes. And just like a rope, collagen is very flexible. Okay? So it's strong when you pull it end to end, but it is flexible if you relax and just kind of bend it. Okay? And I will prove that to you in a couple of weeks. Something to look forward to. 
those of you who are not here today, make a note to be here in a couple of weeks. Okay, so we have this thick rope composed of these small individual fibers of tropocollagen. which are the subunits. Now, I mentioned these yeah, because, again, they're very important to the strength of this fiber. And we learned about them because of sailors. Anyone know what kind of problems sailors used to have back in the 1700s, 1800s? Scurvy. Okay, so something called scurvy. What is scurvy? So can anyone tell me what happens to people who have scurvy? Yeah. Your teeth fall out. Yeah. Okay, so teeth fall out. Anything else? Yes, it's due to lack of vitamin C. Okay. Okay, their tissues do not repair, so decreased healing. So wounds don't heal. Okay. Broken bones don't mend. Okay. That falls under under tissue healing. Why? Because all of it has to do with collagen. Okay? Vitamin C is absolutely crucial for this process here, this, con this conversion of lysine and proline into hydroxylysine and hydroxyproline. Okay? Without vitamin C, you can still produce tropocollagen. You can still export it outside the cell. You can still have the fibers interacting with each other weakly, but you can't form those bonds between individual subunits so you can have a very thick, strong fiber. So you make a very weak fiber instead, and this fiber gets damaged very easily. So the moment you put some stress on it, the moment you put some tension on both ends of that rope, it falls apart. Okay? This is why you lose teeth. This is why you can't heal wounds, because the moment you put some pressure on that healing wound, the epithelium breaks, and then underneath that, very weak connective tissue. And that, again, causes more damage, more bleeding, etc. So again, I went into this not because I just felt like reviewing some biochemistry with you guys, but because it's actually important to connective tissues in general. This, this strength of the collagen itself depends very much on this conversion of typical amino acids into this hydroxylated form. Yeah. I don't remember at this point. You can look it up online if you'd like. Okay. All right. So again, scurvy, etc. Now that's true of most collagens, but again, type one collagen is the most abundant, and so that's the one that's going to be mostly affected by this. And it's also the one that is the strongest. It's the one that is really specialized for dealing with really high tension, a lot of stress. So again, places that deal with a lot of stress will tend to have a lot of collagen. So bones will have a lot of collagen type 1. You know, uh, your dermis will have a lot of collagen type 1. And again, it's arranged, as I will show you very soon, in a way such that it can resist tension in many different directions. Okay? So uh, that's type 1 collagen. Um, there's others. Type 2 collagen is found in cartilage. Okay? That's really the only place where you're going to find that one. It's cartilage. Anyone write that one down, because it's going to show up at some point. Type 3 collagen is actually reticular fibers, so that's just another name for it. Um, these reticular fibers, or type 3 collagen, uh, is a much weaker type of collagen. It's not bundled into these thick ropes. Instead, what we have is a network of fibers. So reticular fibers will be more like this, where you have these highly branched sort of fibers connected to one another. And we tend to find this type of collagen in places where we need a lot of flexibility, places that need to deform very easily. 
and not necessarily become damaged. So because these fibers are arranged in many different directions, uh, they can arrange themselves in different directions. Because they are branched, they can be squished and squeezed in many different directions without really causing too much damage. But if you start pulling on them, they don't have the strength to be able to resist that tension, and they will break. So it's a fairly weak fiber in that way, but it's very good at forming this kind of a network on which cells can sit. So for example, like your adipocytes, or fat cells, will tend to sit on a reticular fiber network. We also tend to see a lot of reticular fibers in lymphatic organs, okay, where basically you have a lot of lymphocytes, which are not only attached to tissue, they're kind of just free-floating cells, but they will sit on this network of reticular fibers because it makes a nice mesh and everything else kind of flows back by them. And again, we'll talk about that in a few weeks as well. Type 4 collagen uh, is found in the basement membranes along with type 7. And type 5 is periodically found within smooth muscle basal lamina. Okay? So again, the main ones really to know about are type 1, which is found most of the time in most places, Type 2, which is in cartilage. Type 3, which is type the uh, reticular fiber. We'll talk about that periodically in different parts of this course. And then type 4, which we just talked about last week, which is in basement membranes. Those are the four main ones that you really need to know about uh, the locations. Now, aside for collagen, Which, oh, by the way, reticular fibers, uh, one of the things to know about them is that they don't really pick up stains very easily. We tend to need to stain them with silver. Okay? And so reticular fibers are argeophilic. So argeophilic means silver-loving. Okay. The other type of fiber is elastic fiber. And elastic fibers are composed of a scaffold of fibrillin. And on that scaffold are going to be arranged fibers of elastin. Now, basically you can think of elastic fibers as the spandex of your body, or spandex of your tissues. You don't need a lot of it to make a tissue elastic. But when you do have it present, it allows for a lot of recoil. Okay? What do I mean by that? Well, it's easy enough to stretch something. You just apply force to it. Okay? Take a typical cotton shirt. Pull on it really hard. It'll stretch. Is it going to recoil back? No. It's going to stay stretched. Okay? But if you add 5% you know, um, spandex to that shirt, you can stretch it and recoils back, okay? returns back to its original size and shape. Okay? Same idea with tissues. If they have elastic fibers within them, they're capable of being stretched and then recoiling back to their original size and shape. Okay? So elastin tends to be used in tissues that need to be stretched and then need to be able to recoil back to normal. So for example, blood vessels, which need to be able to accommodate increases in blood pressure, because again, your, bump, your heart doesn't pump things continuously, your heart pumps a little bit at a time. And so you have this beating of the heart that basically pumps, increases pressure, and then relaxes. Increases pressure, relaxes. And that means that blood vessels are dealing with blood that is pumping in a very rhythmic way. It needs to be able, and so blood vessels that accommodate that blood need to be able to stretch with the increase in pressure and then recoil back. Stretch and recoil back. And you need to be able to do this over and over and over for the span of your life, basically. Other areas of your body that need to be able to have elasticity. Your skin, for example, 
need to be elastic. Okay? This way, for example, those of us who gain some weight in winter, especially around Christmas time, um, you know, we need to be able to pack on a few pounds, and then when we lose them, you know, our skin doesn't kind of just sit there flabby, it kind of recoils to some extent, slowly, but it does. Okay? Um, your bladder, your urinary bladder. We talked about the epithelium last week. Okay? The epithelium is capable of being stretched and then can recoil, but the epithelium doesn't recoil on its own. It's the connective tissues around it that really recoil. The epithelium just accommodates expansion and contraction. Okay? The tissues underneath that, connective, that epithelium are very elastic, and so that when your bladder fills, they accommodate, and when you empty the bladder, they can recoil back to their original size. Okay? So places where you do need to have elasticity, you have elastic fibers. Now, here's the thing about elastic fibers. Fibrillin is susceptible to something called photoaging. What is photoaging? Basically, exposure to UV light. Okay. UV light damages fibrillin. Now, fibrillin is asking, acting as a scaffolding on which the elastin fibers are deposited and to which they are bound. Okay. If you lose that scaffolding, the elastic fibers aren't bound to anything. They're, even though they're present, they're not going to be able to recoil anything because they're not attached to anything. Okay? If you want two things to recoil, they need to be attached to one another in some way. Okay? If you lose that attachment, you lose elasticity. Okay? What does that cause? Photoaging. Okay? Have you ever met anyone who's done a lot of tanning? Probably. What are their, does their skin look like? Besides being very dark. Unnaturally so in many cases. It's very rough. It's wrinkly. Okay? We get wrinkles because we lose elasticity in our skin. Okay? Again, that happens over time. We gain wrinkles as we age because our cells can't keep up with producing the same amount of elastin that they did when we were young. So, well, I guess that brings us to a, a kind of unrelated point, but somewhat related. We have different categories of cells. We have cells that are called labile cells. We have cells called stable cells. Or I guess you could call them cell populations. There are cells called permanent cells. Okay. Now, labile cells or labile cell population are cells that are capable of dividing fairly rapidly. So about a little bit more than 1.5% might be undergoing mitosis. These are cells that are capable of dividing relatively indefinitely throughout your lifetime. Okay? So they can generate more cells. Epithelial cells are a good example of this. Okay? Epithelia are highly regenerative. You, know, you look at your skin, you can scratch at it for the rest of your life, and you will have those cells being regenerated. They will be replenished. Okay? And that's because those cells in that basal layer of cells the very bottom layer of the stratified epithelium, the cells there are capable of division throughout their life. Okay. Most of the cells in your body belong to this population here, well, aside for epithelial cells, which is a stable cell population, which less than about 1.5% are undergoing mitosis. And Again, a majority of these cells are going to be limited 
to how many times they can undergo mitosis. Okay. In most cells, there is a limit to how many times a cell can divide. Why? Telomeres. Okay. What are telomeres? Yeah. The ends of chromosomes. Now, when a cell replicates, when a DNA is being replicated, the telomeres shorten. Every time that cell divides, the telomeres become shorter. At some point, there's no more junk DNA left for you to lose. At some point, the cell's going to say, I can't divide anymore. If I do, I'm not going to replicate all of my DNA that I require to replicate. And so they stop. In most cases, uh, most cells can divide about 50 times before they have to stop. Okay. Again, that would be most of these cells here in the stable cell population. They don't divide frequently, and there's a limited number of times that they can divide. Most of them will be dividing fairly early on in your life to give you the size that you are now. And then they will slow down. Over time, they will die out. As we get older, we have fewer and fewer of these cells. The other thing that will happen is that these cells over time become less efficient. Okay? As we age, our cells become less efficient. And so cells that, like fibroblasts, for example, I've mentioned them before, which produce these elastic fibers, will not be producing them at the same rate that they used to. And so even without photoaging, we're still going to get wrinkles because our cells are just not keeping up with producing enough elastin to maintain our skin uh, and its appearance. At which point, I guess you can start buying into the hype in the cosmetics industry and start buying creams with elastin in them because somehow elastin is supposed to be able to pass across your epithelium and into your underlying connective tissue and somehow make it more elastic. I seriously doubt that that actually works, but go ahead and spend the money if you'd like. Okay. Now, the last category here is permanent cells. We'll be seeing some of them when we talk about muscle, for example. And these are cells that do not divide. Okay. Once they are made, they do not undergo mitosis. They are there, hopefully for the entire lifetime, unless you do something to them. Okay. But for example, your cardiac muscle cells, they're not going to divide. You're stuck with the number you have. Be nice to them. Okay? Same with brain cells, your neurons. They're not dividing. Okay? So be nice to them. Yes? Sorry? Fibroblasts. OK, so. Now, again, getting back to elastic fibers, these tend to be fairly thin. On a slide, again, they don't usually pick up stain with your typical H&E preparation. So we have to have special stains to stain them, which is why if you're looking for a, at a slide that has elastic fibers on it, it usually has a very different sort of coloration to it. One of the stains that we tend to use for elastic fibers is called Orsian which gives elastic fibers kind of this purplish brown color. Okay? So sometimes you will see this kind of a dark hair-like sort of filament going across. It's probably an elastic fiber. Okay? In some cases, we don't stain it, but we can still see it. And the next few slides are there to show us some of the connective tissue and the fibers within it. So this slide here is actually showing us longitudinal section through a blood vessel. In a few weeks, you will be able to identify this blood vessel fairly easily. But let's focus on the stuff around it. So this stuff here in yellow, you can see is very fibrous. You can see individual fibers. This would actually be considered a fairly loose connective tissue. This will become important later on when we're talking about the, diff the difference between loose and dense connective tissue. But I want you to notice the fact that we have nuclei here, and they're not much 
smaller or bigger than the thickness of one of these individual fibers. So these individual fibers are type 1 collagen. But it's a fairly loose connective tissue, so this type 1 collagen here is not forming those thick ropes that are designed to really withstand a lot of stress. It's just kind of a loose sort of arrangement of these individual little threads. Okay? When we talk about dense connective tissues, that's when we talk about collagen that is much thicker, relies much more on that cross-linking, and requires a lot more strength because it is dealing with a lot of tension, a lot of stress. Okay? So this is a fairly loose connective tissue. But here you can actually see individual collagen fibers. Okay? Not the subunits. These are still composed of you know, these cross-linked fibers, but there are just not as many of them in these bundles here. Okay? So that's collagen. This slide here is taken from the spleen. You will recognize it as such in a few weeks. Um, but what we have here are nuclei, which are just kind of these pink structures that you can see, mostly belonging to lymphocytes and other types of cells that we'll learn about as we go along. But these black fibers you're seeing here are reticular fibers. Okay? They form the, me nesh the, the, the meshwork, the network of fibers on which these other cells sit. Okay? So they don't have to be attached to anything, the cells themselves just kind of sit on this kind of a network of fibers, this netting. Okay? Uh, and you can see here very scraggly looking lines, very highly branched, okay? very irregular, and very dark staining. This black is telling you that this was stained with silver. Okay? If you can see black lines going across, chances are it was stained with silver. Okay? And if we're staining a slide with silver, there's a good reason for it. We want to show you something that is only stainable with silver. And in this case here, it's reticular fibers. This slide here is another blood vessel. You will be able to identify this blood vessel in a few weeks. For the time being, I just want to show you the elastic fibers. And in this case here, it was not stained. So the, la the elastic fibers here were not stained. We did not use orcine in this slide. This is just a typical H&E slide. What you want to look for is a portion of the slide that does not have any stain on it. I'm not talking about this area here, because that's basically the inside of a blood vessel. You can see the epithelium or the endothelium here. Okay, you can see the individual nuclei at the surface. But just underneath that endothelium, you can see this kind of a fairly thick band of just this pale space. It doesn't seem to be anything there that's picking up stains. So this right here, this line, okay, this just underneath the endothelium, that empty space is filled with a lot of elastin. Okay? In fact, in blood vessels, it's very, very thick, especially in arteries, because they are dealing with a lot of pressure and the blood at high pressure coming in and pulsating. So they need to be able to recoil. And so they have a lot of elastic fibers, especially underneath that endothelium. And so they do have a very thick layer of it in this case. So in many cases, it's just individual fibers, individual strands. In blood vessels, it's an actual sheet, a continuous sheet of elastic fibers. And you can actually see it here because it is not stained. So everything else around it is stained, but you can see this kind of a wavy band underneath the endothelium that is not stained. Okay? And you can still see it. Okay? okay, so that was the fibers. Now to the other part of the ECM which is called the ground substance. Sometimes referred to as the amorphous ground substance, meaning that it has no real structure. It's fairly non-structured. Basically, we're looking at something that has the consistency of jello. Okay? Doesn't look like much, but it's fairly gelatinous, it's fairly thick, and also very, very highly hydrated. It has a lot of water within it. Now, the presence of that water is what allows for diffusion of substances across. Okay? This is a very, very important component of connective tissues because it allows for diffusion to happen. Okay? So for example, with the connective tissues, you will have blood vessels passing through, you will have capillaries. But they won't, pass, pass, they won't go past every single cell in your connective tissue. So some cells will be fairly far away from our blood supply. So the nutrients that they carry, the oxygen that they carry, 
needs to be able to diffuse across those cells fairly efficiently. And this is why we have this hydration. Okay? This allows for easy diffusion of substances across. Also, any communication, any kind of signaling molecules can easily pass across this as well. So it allows for communication between cells. This will become very important when we talk about cartilage and bone next week. So keep that in mind. Okay? Now what is it made of? It's made of things called proteoglycans. What is a proteoglycan? What does the name tell us? Well, protein and sugars. Okay. So what we have is basically a protein core which has carbohydrate chains attached to it along its length. Okay. So what? Well, this right here is a glycosaminoglycan. Okay. Now, most glycosaminoglycans are sulfated, most of them. What does this, that tell you about their charge? First of all, are they highly charged? A physiological pH? Did something has a sulfate group? Is something with a sulfate group capable of hydrogen bonding with things? Yes. Boy, that was tough. Okay. So if it's sulfated, it has a negative charge. It's a pretty strong negative charge. Oh boy, now we're trying to figure out what does a sulfate group looks like. God. What does it look like? What's sulfuric acid? What's the formula for sulfuric acid? H2SO4, right? So we got some S, and we got four O's. Okay. If it's in the body at physiological pH, the H's are not there. Okay. So it's just a sulfate with four oxygens. Is that capable of hydrogen bonding? Oh yeah, a lot of hydrogen bonds. So very highly charged. They're capable of making a lot of hydrogen bonds. Okay? That means water is going to be all over that. Okay? Water is going to be attached to these things very strongly. So it's interacting with these very strongly. It means that they are going to aggregate a lot of water to themselves. They're going to hold on to a lot of water. This is why these glycosaminoglycans glycans are there. They are there to maintain water in the region. This way you can have things like diffusion occurring. If you don't have glycosaminoglycans, if you don't have a lot of them, there's not going to be as much water. There's not going to be as much diffusion going across. Okay. So we can have, and this is the protein core, proteoglycans that kind of look like this. We can have proto proteoglycans that have only a few glycosaminoglycans. And we have proteoglycans that look like this. This is a bottle brush. You can think of this as the, the protein core. Each one of these fibers is a glycosaminoglycan. Okay. Remember to think of these things in three dimensions. There's hundreds of these things attached to a protein core. Okay. These will be especially important when we talk about cartilage okay, next week. Okay. So you can have a protein core that has two to three hundred of these glycosaminoglycans attached. Again, all highly charged. All 
all of them capable of holding on to a lot of water. Some of the names you're going to see are chondroitin sulfate, heparin sulfate with an A. Oops, let's move this up a little bit. Keratin sulfate. Does this one in particular here look familiar to anyone? Chondroitin sulfate? Anyone walk through the health food section of their grocery store lately? Or are you guys too young to worry about that sort of thing? There's a lot of chondroitin sulfate in cartilage. And there are a lot of supplements of chondroitin sulfate that they sell for people who might be suffering from, sorry? Arthritis, yes? Okay, sorry, I just can't hear you from all the way here. Okay, so arthritis, okay? Arthritis basically means that cartilage might be a little worn out on the ends of your bones, and so the joints start to hurt, okay? And so, again, I'm not sure how much of this is actually going to help but the hope is that a lot of this will get converted into the heparin or sorry, the chondroitin sulfate that is going to be part of your cartilage. Okay? Again, part of the reason that cartilage wears down is that we have fewer of these molecules being produced because we get older. Cells become less efficient at producing these things and replenishing the components that are there. And if you lose water in your cartilage, you're not going to be able to have a strong a sort of tissue and as smooth a tissue as you did before. Okay? We'll talk about that next week. Okay. And their metan sulfate. So the, those are the four main glycosaminoglycans. There's another one that's fairly common called hyaluronic acid or Hyaluronan. It's a bit of a mouthful, that one. Okay? But both of these are the same thing. Okay? But you might refer to them as either of those two terms, depending on where you go for your information. This is not a sulfated glycosaminoglycan. Yes? Sorry? Can they be used as cosmetic fillers? Just about anything can be used as a cosmetic filler. I don't know. It's possible. I haven't looked at the cosmetics, so I don't know. I don't read cosmetic labels. But you can definitely take a look and let me know. It's possible. I don't know. Okay. Uh, and again, there are components, for example, things like heparin sulfate, which is a typical molecule found in your body, in your connective tissues. But this can actually be converted into something called heparin which has a very different function. Okay. So again, some of these molecules can easily be converted biochemically into something else that might be useful as well. Now, hyaluronic acid is not sulfated. And it's not attached as part of this bottle brush. Hyaluronic acid is actually a very long polymer to which these bottle brush structures are attached. So you're going to have these protein cores attached to it, and then glycosaminoglycans that are sulfated attached to that. And so what you can end up with are these very long strands of hyaluronic acid which have proteoglycans attached to them and kind of look like this. So this green line that you're seeing on this diagram here is hyaluronic acid. Now to that are attached these bottle brush structures 
And again, how frequently they are attached, how many of them are attached, will depend on the type of tissue we're looking at and how much hydration that tissue requires. Now, again, as we get older, we get less efficient at producing these or repairing these, and we have fewer and fewer, and so our bodies tend to retain less water. It doesn't seem that way, but our tissues retain a little bit less water. Um, they become less efficient at getting rid of things. Um, the shorter these hyaluronic acid uh, components become, the more easily the whole thing becomes degraded. And again, that tends to happen in older individuals, especially in cartilage. And again, this is probably one of the reasons that we have arthritis occurring, is at a certain point, these molecules just become very, very short. And so you end up with these easily degraded molecules that don't hold on to as much water anymore. Okay. These pink fibers you see in between all of these are collagen fibers. Okay, so if you think about this picture now, we have basically a rough idea of what the ECM looks like in connective tissues. You have fibers, mostly type 1 collagen, and we have these hyaluronic acid polymers with proteoglycans attached to them holding onto a lot of water. You might notice if you look at this that this seems like a fairly busy picture. There's a lot of stuff here. Again, yeah, imagine this in three dimensions. There's a lot of stuff in that connective tissue outside the cells. Why is this important? Well, if you think about this, if you're a cell, you're about you know, the size of maybe this thing right here, if it was the same scale as this, probably a little bit bigger than that, actually. Try squeezing through all that stuff. Basically, it's a jungle out there. It's really packed. Okay? If you're a cell, you're going to have a hard time passing through this. Why is this a good thing? Well, if you think about this, if you have a cut and some bacteria manage to get their way into the cut, work their way into the connective tissues, you probably want to keep them localized. You don't want to have them spreading all over your body right away and getting to wherever they like. You want to keep them all in place. Okay? And so having this kind of a very dense sort of network of fibers and ground substance makes it very difficult for any cell to pass through. Okay. Now, that makes it more difficult for your own cells of your immune system to also get through as well. But signaling molecules can still diffuse very easily. And so, so you know, molecules that indicate, oh, there is something in this area here that can attract you know, a phagocyte, a cell of your immune system into the area, can pass through very easily because it is hydrated. So water molecules allow for diffusion to occur very easily. Okay. So you can have these chemoattractants, these signaling molecules, basically spreading outwards from the area of infection. That's going to attract a whole bunch of cells from your immune system. Cells of your immune system are specialized to be able to cut through all of this. They have the enzymes necessary to break down and break through these, these, this tissue, this ECM, to get to where they need to go. Well, if those enzymes exist, you just know that some pathogens will figure out a way to produce them of their own. Okay? Have you guys heard of flesh-eating disease? Yes. Okay. What is flesh-eating disease? Oh, boy. Next time you won't answer any more questions. I know. That's okay. So basically, Staphylococcus aureus, basically, it's a specific strain, but it's capable of actually producing the same types of enzymes. It can actually produce enzymes that break down all of this so they can, it can spread more easily. And also, because it can thrive in that environment, it can also start to divide very rapidly, remove all the oxygen from the area, basically kill off all the cells around it as well because we're starting to deal with anaerobic conditions. Okay? Again, bacteria divide very quickly. They can live just as easily anaerobically as aerobically. They will use up all the oxygen faster than your own cells will. Your cells now have a lack of oxygen. Okay? 
And so all of a sudden you have cell death occurring around the area of infection, which means the cells are no longer available to replenish this as well. And you end up with a disease that breaks down connective tissues very, very rapidly. Okay, so again, there are both sides to that particular knife. Our own cells can cut through this, but there are pathogens that can do the same thing as well. Good news is, as you'll find out, is that many of the cells of our immune system are quite capable of working within these hypoxic conditions, and they can work just fine without having access to oxygen as well. Okay. So that's the fibers. Let's talk about cells. As in the stuff you thought we would be talking about today. So I'm going to introduce a few cells. This is by no means a complete list of all the cells found within connective tissues, but it's the ones that we will mention in some way today. Okay. So any list of connective tissue cells, we'll start with mesenchyme cells. Mesenchyme cells are basically stem cells. These are cells that you'd find in the embryo. And these are the cells that will differentiate into pretty much most of what you've got on this list here. Okay. So mesenchyme cells are the cells that differentiate into other cell types within connective tissues. These are the stem cells of connective tissue. And the tissue that these produce, or the tissues within which these are found, again, in the embryo, are called mesenchyme tissues. Okay. We'll talk more about those very shortly when we get to the slide on that tissue. Next one on the list is probably the most common one, is the fibroblast. Okay. So pretty much probably one of the more common cell types in your body, uh, especially when it comes to connective tissues, is going to be the fibroblast. The fibroblast is a cell that produces all of those fibers we just talked about, all that ground substance. Those are mostly produced by fibroblasts. These are very busy cells. They work very hard. Um, but again, these are part of that um, stable cell population, which doesn't divide very frequently and has a limit to how many times they can divide. Okay? Again, there's a slide a little further on that talks more about them. Macrophage is another cell that we'll find in connective tissue. This is not a cell that really originates within that tissue. Macrophages are part of the immune system in a way. And so what you have is basically a cell that originates in the bone marrow, starts out as a monocyte. Let's just write that down. So these start out in the bone marrow as a monocyte. The monocytes will circulate. They find an area where they want to get into. And then they will differentiate into a macrophage. Now, monocytes are part of the immune system. They are phagocytic cells. And so are macrophages. So macrophages are phagocytic. So they're fairly nonspecific. So anything that they find that doesn't seem to belong, they will engulf and try to break down. Okay. Now, their activity, their phagocytic activity, is actually enhanced if that something is actually coated by an antibody. So if you have something that is coated by an antibody, these cells become about 100 times more efficient at taking it up, okay. which is why antibodies are important, because they allow for a much faster removal of foreign organisms from your body or viruses. Now, because they are phagocytic, they require lysosomes. But again, lysosomes are very, very small, and so we usually don't see them under the light microscope. Just about the only feature of a macrophage we can see under the microscope is its nucleus, which is somewhat elongated, somewhat rounded. It might have a slight indentation. This is what most histology books and histologists will tell you to look for, is a nucleus that is somewhat indented. 
And that's because it differentiates from a monocyte. And monocyte nuclei are kidney bean shaped, as you'll find out in a few weeks. So you don't have to know that part yet. Okay? But look for an indentation in the nucleus. Now, remember, cells are three-dimensional. You don't always see the indentation. Okay. Are you going to be able to recognize it under the microscope any other way? No. Okay. Am I going to ask you to identify a macrophage on a slide? No. Okay. Because it just looks just like a fibroblast in many cases. It's going to be dispersed in between fibroblasts and it will look just like it. Unless you can see that it has engulfed something, and you can see some sort of garbage in its cytoplasm, you can't tell it that it's a macrophage. The only way that pathologists can tell if it's a macrophage is because they have specific staining techniques. They can use specific um, antibodies against surface components on a macrophage that will help them to identify it positively as this is a macrophage. Okay? With a typical HNE preparation, which is what you guys will be looking at, you can't tell, okay? So don't try, because unless they look like this, you can't tell that it's a macrophage. So what we're looking at here is actually a slide from the chest of a smoker, okay? The stuff that smokers breathe in is pretty nasty. Some of it is in the form of these carbon particles. Now, interesting thing is macrophages can't actually break down carbon particles. Okay. They can't. So what do they do? They accumulate it, which is what you're seeing here. All of these st structures that contain a lot of these carbon particles, these are individual macrophages. The small dots you're seeing are the actual carbon particles engulfed by the macrophage. Now, here's the thing. Once a macrophage engulfs something, if it can't break it down, it becomes immobilized. It doesn't move on to do something else. It just kind of stays there. Okay? So what we have is macrophages containing these carbon particles that aren't going anywhere. They're just kind of stuck there. And again, the more carbon particles there are, the more of these macrophages will accumulate. Usually, in the connective tissues don't have this many macrophages this close together. They're spread out fairly you know, uh, randomly. And there's not going to be a lot of them all together. Um, they're not terribly abundant within tissues. But again, if you have an area that has a lot of carbon particles or something else that's a foreign body that has to be removed, then these cells will come along and they will start to take it up. And as you need more of them, more of them will, will arrive. Okay? So again, the number of macrophages you're seeing here is not exactly normal. This is just because so many carbon particles were present that more of them needed to arrive remove them. Okay. Again, this is a foreign substance that cannot be easily broken down, and so it stays. It persists within the body. It just happens to be sequestered from the rest of the tissue by the macrophages themselves. Can you think of any other kind of thing that might do the same sort of thing? Anyone here have a tattoo? I'm not going to ask where. Don't worry. So if you have a tattoo, you have some brightly colored macrophages in your body. Okay? Because the tattoo pigment, this is why tattoos are permanent. Tattoo pigment's not going in. It can't be broken down by your body. It can't be broken down by the macrophages. Macrophages just get there. They take up the pigment, then they become immobilized, and they stay in that place. Okay? So again, same idea with tattoos. Basically, you have a lot of pigment. Macrophages get into the area. They try to break it down, but they can't. They don't have necessary enzymes to break down the pigment, and so they simply just engulf it and keep it there. Question? The macrophages themselves continue living and maintaining themselves. They don't die, but they're just stuck there. They can't move on until they've broken down whatever it is they've engulfed. Okay? So, yes, here you've got a mention of the fact that the nucleus is a little bit more irregular than a fibroblast. But again, you can't really tell that very easily under the microscope because they are three-dimensional cells. And again, macrophages are cells that can actually move around. So they can crawl through the tissues. They would be able to cut through 
some of this to get to wherever they need to. Okay? They can migrate to find their target. Okay, uh, next one on the list, adipocyte, fat cell. Okay? These are used for energy storage, but again, act as a shock absorber as well. We'll talk about those when we talk about the tissues. Next one on the list is a mast cell, which is the next one on the list here. This is um, a relatively large ovoid cell, about 30 micrometers, 20 to 30 micrometers in diameter or so. So they are relatively large. And it has a relatively round nucleus, so shouldn't look for indentations there. But again, depending on how, how you slice a nucleus, they're all going to look round. So it's not going to be terribly helpful if you're looking at it for that way. So one of the things that we do look for if we're looking for mast cells is something called metachromasia. Okay? Um, Metachromatic granules are basically granules which stain differently than the stain with which they have been treated. Okay. So, um, in order to actually visualize mast cells, there's a special fixation process that they need to undergo, and then they are stained with something called, or a stain called toluidine. blue. Okay. And this stain allows these cells to look different because under normal conditions a mast cell will look like this. If you just stain it with H and E, you're going to have a cell that looks like this. If you stain a fibroblast with H and E, it will look like this. If you stain a macrophage with H and E, it will look like, let's put the indentation in there just for fun. It will look like this. What's the difference? So this is why we use toluidine blue, because if we use that, then we end up with a cell that has a nucleus and has I'm going to use purple, but usually it's more pink than purple. Very brightly stained pink. Well, I should have used red, actually. Granules. Okay. And that's what metachromasia is. If you stain it with a stain, everything else around the cell, the rest of the tissue, will look a different color than this. And the metachromasia, so this is a metachromatic granule. The metachromasia is due to the fact that we have heparin inside it. Okay. Two of the main components. Inside these granules are heparin and histamine. But it's really the heparin that causes that change in color that we see on the slides. OK, so what is a mast cell? Mast cell, again, is a component of your immune system. So again, it's going to be a cell that's found there to protect your connective tissues from outside invaders. This is a cell that's actually uh, involved in allergic reactions. How many of you have allergies? I'm not going to ask any tough questions after this. It's OK to own up. Okay. So we've got allergies. We've got al allergy sufferers. Uh, we're just getting into your wonderful part of the year, aren't we? Okay. Do you guys take antihistamines for your allergies? How well do they work if you take antihistamines? Not very well. Do you get initial relief, though? Initially, no? Nothing? Does anybody take antihistamines that they actually do something for them? OK. Right. Well, these cells do are actually involved in anaphylactic shock. Basically, anaphylactic shock basically means that all the mast cells in the body react they will actually cause vasodilation, which means blood vessels open up, their caliber opens. 
What happens to the flow of fluids in a pipe that becomes more open? It slows down. Okay. That means your heart can't pump enough blood back to reperfuse your organs. And if you don't do something about that, you can die very easily. Okay? Because you just don't have enough blood pumping to the rest of your body. Okay? So it's a very, very serious issue. Okay? And again, mast cells are very much involved in it. So you take antihistamines, right? Do they work? All the time, or do they work initially and then they kind of stop? Okay, all right. So there, are, this isn't really working for me this time around. I don't know what's going on. Um, a lot of people who take antihistamines will say, okay, initially the antihistamine does work, but then after a few hours, I just get the symptoms again. Okay. And again, depending on what type of a reaction you have, you might have different effects. Um, but in many cases, if you have this sort of thing happening, you will have an antihistamine initially working, and then it stops. And after a while, it just doesn't do anything. It doesn't really relieve the symptoms anymore. Okay? And it is about relieving the symptoms, because antihistamines don't do anything to relieve your allergy. You still have the allergy. Uh, you just simply, it just takes the symptoms away. Okay? Why is that? Well, histamine is a vasodilator, okay? okay? So it opens up blood vessels. It slows down the flow of blood. It allows the blood to pool in areas, okay? which means, as you'll find out, if blood is slowing down and pooling, it probably builds up some pressure inside blood vessels and starts to leak out. It also increases blood vessel permeability. So again, blood, and especially water from the bloodstream, tends to leak out into the tissues. So we tend to have swelling in certain areas, okay? especially mucous areas like nasal passages, okay? vasodilation. But also does bronchoconstriction. Okay? Which means that your airways tend to close up, make it more difficult to breathe. It has to do with muscle, and it's just that the muscle and blood vessels have a different type of receptor that reacts to histamine differently than the muscle in your airways, uh, which causes constriction, whereas in blood vessels it causes dilation. Okay. Heparin is an anticoagulant. Okay. Which means it prevents the clotting of blood. It's an important thing to have if you're going to dilate blood vessels and have blood just pool in areas, because if you have that much blood pooling in an area, clotting could very easily start. And clotting is something that is a cascade. There are many different molecules involved, many different enzymes involved. If you get just enough of them interacting with one another, something's just randomly going to occur, and you're going to have a blood clot starting. And once it starts, it's very difficult to stop and control the process. Okay? And so an anticoagulant is important in that it keeps the blood thin, it keeps it from clotting up. And again, I mentioned earlier, heparin is basically just a converted glycosaminoglycan. Heparin sulfate starts out as heparin sulfate and is converted into heparin. Okay? Now, here's the thing. Here's the way I mentioned the antihistamines. Antihistamines work on this. They stop this part here from the histamine itself from having its effect. Okay? And so... If you are having an allergic reaction, you know, hay fever or whatever, and you take an antihistamine, you feel better initially. Okay? Because you stop this from performing its job. Okay? However, many people will report that afterwards, things get worse again, and the, the symptoms return, no matter what you do. And that's because after a while, mast cells will produce something called leukotrienes. Oops. Okay. Or sometimes known as SRSA, slow releasing, uh, slow releasing sub substance of anaphylaxis. Okay. It's the same thing. All the literature will have it as SRSA. 
more recent literature will refer to as Luca Trines. Okay? More specifically, LTC4. You don't have to know that, it's okay. okay. What is a Luca Trine? A Luca Trine is basically another molecule that is produced by these cells after degranulation. So the granules themselves mostly will contain these two components. They are released and they have an initial, in their initial effect. Okay. That effect will eventually wear off. But these cells are designed to continue stimulating kind of an immune reaction. So what's going to happen is that over time, they will be producing these. And after a while, enough of them will be produced to have an effect of their own. And their effect is very much the same as the effect of histamine. Okay? Which is why antihistamines might give you some initial relief, but don't necessarily continue that. And so the symptoms do return. Because after a while, the symptoms are caused by the leukotrienes and not the histamine anymore. So the antihistamines will stop the histamine from doing its job, but they won't do anything against the leukotrienes. But again, the reason that, that that response is delayed is that it takes some time to build up enough of these for them to have an effect. Once they, there are enough of these, they have very much the same sort of effect as histamine, vasodilation, and bronchoconstriction. Now, why would a mast cell release these? Let me just make sure I'm... Why would a cell release these? So let's say we have, yes? An anti-leukotriene. Um, I'm sure you could very well try to make one of those. And if you did, I'm sure you'd make a lot of money doing it. Um, but as far as I know, there's no anti-leukotriene. Um, it's, it's basically a lipid molecule. It's a, it's a lipid converted molecule. Uh, and I'm not really sure that you can build an antibody against that. I don't think you can build antibodies against lipids. Um, and uh, I'm not really sure if there's a specific enzyme that could cleave it into something that's harmless. Uh, but even then, you'd have to introduce it into an area that um, would be relatively small, and you'd have to introduce it by injecting it into the body somehow. So it would be very difficult, I think. Okay? So any means are a bit easier to deliver, I think. Um, anti-leukotrienes, I don't know. If you do find a way to do it, please tell me, because I'd love to know, because I'm sure we could make some money on that. Anyway, so let's see, let's say that this is, a lymphocyte. You will learn in a few weeks that that's what they look like. Large nucleus, very little cytoplasm. In fact, I think on our list of cells, we have something called a plasma cell, which is actually a differentiated B lymphocyte. And maybe I should just go to that really quick. Actually, you know what? Let's just go over the pictures really quick, and then we'll get back to the mast cell after the plasma cell story. Yeah. So on this slide here, this was stained with Toluidine blue. Okay, so you can see it looks different than an HNE preparation. What you have is glandular tissue on either side. This one here is connective tissue. A lot of it kind of looks orangey yellow. But then there are parts that kind of stick out. So you have this bright pink sort of cell down here. There's another one over here, another one over here, another one over here. So you have a few cells that kind of just stick out from that tissue. I mean, you can compare it to a few other nuclei here and here that don't look like that. Okay? So you can see these are probably the fibroblasts that produce all these collagen fibers that you're seeing here. But then you have these more bright sort of cells showing up within this tissue. And again, it's not the perfect slide because cameras don't always focus very well. Uh, but when you're looking at these things, look for cells that kind of stick out. They don't really belong in that tissue. They don't seem like they belong in that tissue. That's metachromasia. It stains differently than everything else around it. Okay? So these would be mast cells. Now, they tend to occur in areas where you have nerves or blood vessels. Okay? So there's gonna be, if you're looking for mast cells, look in your blood vessels, look in your nerves. How do nerves look like? Like this. They're very pale. 
because nerves have a lot of myelin, which is lipid. Lipid doesn't stain, therefore it doesn't show up very easily on a slide. Okay? So these guys here, these are nerves. It's a blood vessel over here. Uh, and so you can see that we have a lot of these cells that are just kind of clustered around those areas. Okay. Higher magnification. Again, there's a blood vessel over here. There's a mast cell right there. There's a nerve over here, mast cell right there. And you can see it's very bright, except for this region right here. That's the nucleus. Okay. Nucleus of the mast cell. The rest of it is bright pink. Okay. So you're sitting in a really crappy place. You can't see anything I'm pointing to, can you? Okay, so right here we've got a mast cell right there. Okay, bright pink, nice pale nucleus. Okay. And again, surrounding it, lots of collagen fibers, in this case stained uh, yellow. And you can see a lot of other nuclei showing up here that are much more likely to be things like fibroblasts, which would have produced all of these tissues, okay, all of these fibers. So before we get into the uh, activation of mast cells, let's talk about plasma cells, because these are very important in the story. Plasma cells are anti antibody-producing cells. Okay. These are basically start out as a B lymphocyte. So they start looking like this, large, round nucleus, very tiny sliver of cytoplasm around it. Okay. And they circulate, or they're found in lymphatic organs. But when they are stimulated, they will accumulate organelles. Specifically, they will accumulate a lot of rough ER. Okay? So they still have a nucleus. It's going to be nice and round. But you're going to have a lot of cytoplasm around it. And that cytoplasm is going to be filled mostly by rough ER. Because rough ER has a lot of ribosomes, that means we're going to have a very basophilic sort of structure, which is what you're seeing here, a lot of basophilic cytoplasm if you look at these cells, this one, this one, and this one, these are all plasma cells. You can see there's a nucleus, nice and round still. And then around that nucleus, we can see a lot of very purple, very basophilic cytoplasm. Okay? That's because we have lots of rough ER. Okay? Now, if you look carefully, you'll notice that around the, right around the nucleus, it's kind of a fairly pale area here and here and here. This is referred to as the negative Golgi image. Okay? It basically indicates the area where the Golgi apparatus would be. The Golgi apparatus is not going to be stained, and so it's going to look more pale. Why doesn't it look more white? Well, because it's a three-dimensional structure. It sells a three-dimensional structure. You're going to have some rough ER underneath it or some rough ER above it, so there's still going to be some purple staining there. But there's going to be a lot less of it because there's a lot more light passing through that area. Okay? So it's not going to be completely clear. but you can see it's more pale than the rest of the cytoplasm around it. So Golgi apparatus right around here, around the nucleus, the rest of it is just filled with rough ER. And this picture here, you're not going to be tested on EMs, but this picture here is just to help convince you that, in fact, we do have lots of this rough ER around the outside. You can see, especially in this area here, these lines of membranes with little dots on the outside. Those are the ribosomes. Okay? So again, this is why we don't see them under light microscope, because they're so tiny. Okay? But we can see evidence of them because of how much basophilic staining there is in that area. And right in the middle here is where all the other organelles are going to live, the Golgi apparatus and your mitochondria, although we've got them spread out throughout as well. We've got some mitochondria here, centrioles, etc. Okay? So, but again, this region here is going to be pale staining because that's where the non-staining organelles are. The rest of the cytoplasm is just filled with this rough ER. And the rough ER is there because this is an antibody-producing cell. And so it needs to export a lot of protein. Okay? There's a ton of protein that's going to be exported out of the cell. And if it's for export, it needs to go through the, uh, the rough endoplasmic reticulum. It needs to be produced on the rough endoplasmic reticulum and then exported out uh, from the Golgi apparatus. So, again, antibody producing cell. Do you think you're going to have a lot of different parts of DNA activated for this type of cell? No, because you're very specialized at that point. This plasma cell is specialized. It's only going to activate a few genes specifically so that it can produce a very specific type of molecule. Okay? 
which is why you're seeing these nuclei being fairly dark staining. There's not a lot of euchromatin there. There's a lot of heterochromatin. A lot of it's condensed because it's not really necessary, by, not really needed by the cell. Okay. Okay. So plasma cell. Let's get back to the mast cell now. So here's our B cell. Let's say it's exposed to an antigen, some sort of a bad molecule. So it interacts with it, it becomes a plasma cell. Now the characteristic feature of a plasma cell is a nice round eccentric nucleus. Okay, so it's not in the center, it's eccentric, it's off to the side. I usually say eccentric in this case doesn't mean crazy and rich, just means off center. And then lots of rough ER around the outside. Okay. So now it's a plasma cell. Bless you. Now that plasma cell is going to produce antibodies. Antibodies are basically these Y shaped molecules. And the specific type of antibody that is of concern to us in this case is called IgE. Ig stands for immunoglobulin E. Okay. There's different types. Most of the antibodies in your body are of the IgG variety, but sometimes it produces IgE antibodies. Okay, so these Ig antibodies are going to then interact with the cell surface of a mast cell. So I'm just going to draw the mast cell as we had drawn it earlier. So it has a nice round nucleus. And then it's going to be filled with these metachromatic granules. Now, on the surface of the cell are receptors. Okay, these are high affinity receptors. They're called FC receptors. They basically bind the constant region of the antibody, so this tail of the Y. Okay, so you end up with, eventually, all of the IgE, and I do mean all of it, bound to the surface of mast cells. Now, antibodies are produced so that the next time you, you that you're invaded by this pathogen, you recognize it much more quickly, and so that you can mount an immune response very quickly uh, as soon as it's noticed. So on the second invasion by this pathogen, we have an antibody that can very specifically bind to it. Now that antibody is bound to the surface of a mast cell. Okay? Now if this pathogen binds to one of these, nothing happens. But if we have, I'm just going to draw another one of these here just so it's close enough. If we have two of these antibodies become cross-linked because of the presence of this antigen, that's going to cause the degranulation of this mast cell. So all the contents of these granules are dumped out into the extracellular matrix. And as we discussed, this ECM is very water, uh, has a lot of water, it's very highly hydrated, so they diffuse out and start causing all kinds of things like vasodilation, bronchoconstriction, etc. You know, things like you know, runny nose, for example, is part of what happens because of the histamine release. Okay. 
Okay, so let's talk about the tissues now. So I mentioned mesenchyme, tissue, mesenchyme cells and tissues. And so mesenchyme tissues are basically scattered throughout a mesenchyme tissue. There's not much ECM in a mesenchyme tissue because mesenchyme cells are mostly fairly inactive. Okay. One of the things you'll notice about mesenchyme cells, if you do find them, is that they have this kind of a star-shaped appearance to them. Well, we would call it star-shaped, I suppose, but it doesn't really have a specific shape to it. Basically, what you have is a fairly pale nucleus. Okay. So there's going to be some stuff within it, but fairly pale and very little cytoplasm. It's basically just kind of going to do this. And there might be another one. They're quite often attached to another by gap junctions. So as I mentioned earlier, epithelial cells are not the only ones that have gap junctions. You can have other cells have the same thing. Okay. So they can actually communicate with one another so that when one cell starts to differentiate or receives a signal to differentiate, you can pass the message along. Now, the nuclei are fairly pale because these cells have not decided which genes that they don't require. Okay? They haven't been activated to differentiate into a particular um, cell type. And so they don't know yet which parts of their genome they can go safely put away and compact. Okay? But they don't have a lot of cytoplasm because they're not really producing anything. They don't require a lot of organelles. They just need whatever they need to maintain themselves. Again, not much ground substance or fibers on the outside of them because there hasn't been anything to produce them. So it's fairly cellular in a way that, you know, that's really the main component there. There's going to be a little bit of ground substance there, but we usually don't see ground substance on slides because it's usually re leached out during slide preparation. So we can sometimes see that there's something kind of a little bit darker in the background, but we really can't really see much. And in many cases, when we're looking at uh, mesenchyme tissues, we tend to see that it's a mixture of mesenchyme cells and cells that are starting to differentiate into something already. And so that's what you're seeing here is we have a lot of cells, and it's a mess. And I'm not going to ask you to identify mesenchyme cells on a slideshow exam or your bell ringer because which one of these is a mesenchyme cell? It can be hard to tell. My guess, probably about maybe this one here, this one over here, this one over here, are probably mesenchyme cells. Fairly pale nuclei. We don't really see the cell boundaries in this case very well, unfortunately. Uh, the other cell types, you can see the nuclei look a little different. Some of them are starting to get a little dark, and that's probably because they're starting to differentiate into something else. Okay? Uh, the other slide that's, thing that's on this slide is that eventually mesenchyme tissue develops into something we call mucoid tissue. Mucoid tissue is a bit more developed. It still has a lot of mesenchyme cells, but it also is starting to take uh, differentiate into more different types of tissues. And we start to see an, abun uh, an abundance of uh, the ECM uh, becoming a bit more thick, especially ground substance. We see a bit more background showing up on those slides. This is called mucoid jelly. Okay. The other type of loose connective tissue is areolar connective tissue. I showed you an example when I showed you that blood vessel initially when we were looking at collagen. Fairly loose connective tissue means that um, there's very few thick fibers. Mostly the fibers of collagen are fairly thin. There can be many of them. Uh, but it's a fairly wide open sort of tissue. It's not designed for strength. It's just designed for easy diffusion of things. Okay? Um, this is where we see kind of a loose, connect, uh, loose network of fibers, and we see a lot of fibroblasts. Okay? Um, cells and nuclei specifically tend to be more common within loose connective tissues than they are within dense connective tissues. In dense connective tissues, the cells tend to be excluded from the tissue because of the thickness of the fiber. The cells can only exist in between the fibers, not within the fiber. And so we tend to see fewer cells in, in dense connective tissues than we see in loose connective tissues. Uh, and again, most of the cells, there will be fibroblasts, uh, non-phagocytic cells, which produce all the contents of that ECM. And again, sometimes macrophages and plasma cells will be visible. We're not going to ask you to identify plasma cells unless they have been specifically stained for using a stain like toluidine blue, which would allow them to be identified fairly easily. So here's an example of loose areolar connective tissue. Um, this is actually a, 
spread. So basically the tissue that kind of has been stretched over the surface of the slide. It's not a section. It looks a little bit differently in a section. Uh, but basically what we're seeing here are these thick pink fibers or collagen fibers. They're relatively thick compared to everything else, but not, not terribly thick. You can see some of these nuclei here. The thickness of the nucleus is roughly the same as the thickness of the fiber, so they're not terribly thick. The nuclei I just pointed out are basically fibroblast nuclei. Um, if one of them is a macrophage, so be it. Uh, but we really can't tell the difference between macrophages and fibroblasts unless we specifically have an antibody for our cell surface molecule. So as far as we're concerned, they're fibroblasts. Um, next one, it's also loose connective tissue. It's kind of a special sort of case is uh, adipose tissue. This one kind of looks like there's not a lot of ECM. It kind of looks like it doesn't really belong in the category of connective tissues because when you look at it, all of this is fat cells. There's not, lot, not much ECM there. Okay? And yet somehow it's still classified as a, a, a connective tissue. That's because adipocytes initially start out looking very much like fibroblasts. They just fill in, fill up with lipid, and those pools of lipid kind of merge together to form a one large sort of structure. So uh, functions is store metabolized fat, but also as a shock absorber. So this is where the protection function comes into play. And so when we're looking at fat cells, we can have two types. There's white fat, and we have brown fat. Okay. If you have fat, and I say if you have fat, I'm not calling anybody fat. But if you have fat, you have this type. Okay. Babies have this type. Okay. Um, hibernating animals will also tend to have brown fat. Okay. What's the difference? Histologically, we have in white fat a nucleus that's kind of squished to the edges, whereas with brown fat, the nucleus is relatively round. In white fat, basically the rest of the cell is the fat droplet. Now I'm going to draw an outline of the fat droplet here okay, because I want to make a point about this. Okay, this will be referred to as a unilocular cell or unilocular fat cell. And the brown fat would have individual droplets of lipid within the cell, and there's the cell itself. And this would be multilocular. Okay, the white fat cell or the unilocular cell is sometimes referred to as a signet ring or has a signet ring appearance, and that's because it kind of looks like a ring. Looks like it's basically got an outline, clear space, and then there's this nucleus. You'll notice that the nucleus that I've drawn there uh, is fairly tightly packed, very small, very squished. And that's what we tend to see is basically, let me flip, oh, that's the only one I got, okay. So some of these dark spots that you're seeing there are basically the nuclei that have been squished to the side. They're very small, very dark staining because they're fairly inactive. These cell are, cells are basically storing lipid. They're not really doing much else besides that. Okay, they're not producing a lot of things. They're just kind of acting as a storage vehicle. Now you can see that you can see the outlines of these cells fairly clearly. And I've told you in the past they can't see cell outlines because we can't stain lipids. Well you're not seeing it you're not seeing the actual membrane. What you're seeing is all of the organelles that are between the membrane and the lipid droplets. So basically all of this stuff in red Okay. That's the cytoplasm that has been pushed out to the periphery by the fat droplet. Okay. So that's why you're seeing the outlines of these cells. It's not because we can actually see the membrane. It's because all of the actual cytoplasm itself has been squished out to the sides, and that's where it's taken up stain. Okay. Okay. And last of the loose connective tissue is a reticular tissue which basically is, consists of fibroblasts, which are used, uh, tends to be referred to as reticular cells, in this case because they specifically produce reticular fibers. Let me 
particular cells, which are specialized fibroblasts. And they basically produce this meshwork of these very delicate, highly branched argeophilic fibers, which we talked about earlier. Uh, and basically, it tends to be used um, as a meshwork on which other cells can sit. So in this case here, basically we have the spleen, and all these fibers here are acting kind of as an, a network on which all these other cells are using, all these nuclei tend to be in places where you have these fibers. All these nuclei belong to things like lymphocytes and cells like neutrophils or macrophages, which are going to be there, um, not because they're attached to the, mem to the matrix itself, but because they kind of just sit on these fibers. They provide a nice kind of easy chair for them to sit on. Now, when we come to dense connective tissues, there's two main types. Dense connective tissues. We have irregular and regular. And if it's dense, it's dense, it's called dense because the collagen fibers within that tissue are very thick. Okay? So compare the size of the nucleus to the thickness of the fiber, and you'll notice that the fiber is much thicker than the nuclei of the fibroblasts around it. Okay? So that's how we know that a tissue is dense. Look at the thickness of the fibers. They're going to be significantly thicker than the nuclei of the cells that produce them. So that means you have this thick collagen fiber. And by the way, collagen fibers stain eosinophilic. Okay. You might have another going in this direction here. Maybe another one going like this, another one going like this. Because of the thickness of these fibers, you can't have a lot of blood vessels within them. And so you're going to have blood vessels squeezed in periodically somewhere in between them. So this might be a blood vessel. And then periodically you'll notice nuclei, which are very, very small and belong to fibroblasts. Okay. Okay, so you can see how the nucleus is going to be very, very small compared to the actual thickness of the fiber. When it comes to regular, dense, regular connective tissue, we again have thick fibers, but they are arranged in a very regular way. So they tend to be arranged all parallel to one another. And the nuclei will tend to be in rows in between these dense, thick fibers. Examples of regular, dense regular connective tissue are tendons and ligaments. Okay. This here is a good example of dense irregular connective tissue. We've got some adipose tissue over here, a little bit more over here, but this area right here, dense irregular connective tissue. What you need to understand about dense irregular connective tissue, it is designed to withstand stress or tension from any direction. Okay? So your dermis of your skin is composed of dense irregular connective tissue. If you pull your skin, if you pinch yourself and pull it in any direction, no matter what direction you pull in, there's going to be resistance to that tension from any direction. Okay? That's because there's going, any direction you're going to pull in, there's always going to be a bundle of fibers pulling right back because it's arranged in such a way to be able to resist that stress, to re resist that tension. Okay? So what you're seeing here, for example, is a thick bundle of collagen going down across like this on a diagonal. Here's another one, another one. You can see the nuclei over here and here, for example, of fibroblasts. Okay? You can see the nuclei are much smaller than the thickness of an actual bundle. You can see another bundle going across in this direction over here as well. So you can see very thick bundles going in different directions. These guys over here that you're seeing are cut in cross sections, so they're going out towards us on this slide. And that's why you're seeing these kind of roundish sort of structures that are fairly small. It's because these bundles of collagen are cut across. Okay? So they're going out towards us. Okay? 
So you can see that there's different directions, different orientations of these fibers. This is why it's called irregular. And because of how thick these fibers are, it's called dense. Now, if we're looking at dense regular connective tissues like tendons and ligaments, we see something like this, where we have thick bundles of collagen going across, and then in between them we have nice neat rows of nuclei showing up. Okay. So that's the difference. Now, tendons versus ligaments. Oops. Tendons can th connect muscle to bone, whereas ligaments connect bone to bone. If you're stretching before you exercise, you're basically not stretching the tendons between your muscles and the bones. You're stretching the muscles themselves, right? That's because muscles have the ability to recoil. Okay? They can be stretched and they can recoil. We'll learn about that shortly. Okay? But if you're looking at ligaments, they're attaching bones to other bones. If you're going to stretch tissue between two bones, it needs to be able to stretch and recoil. And so the difference histologically is that ligaments look exactly like tendons, but they have elastin within them as well. And that elastin allows them to be able to stretch when you stretch two bones. Uh, so for example, there's a lot of elastic ligaments in your back attaching your vertebrae to one another so that you can actually do this without having any problems. Okay? So you're not damaging any of your ligaments by moving around a little bit. Okay? Um, but the tendon is meant to be a really, really tough tissue. Okay? So if you've eaten turkey, for example, some of the tendons, you can't eat those because they're just so tough. They're like bones almost. Okay? So they're very, very dense. They're very difficult to break through. Uh, they're difficult to cut through if you ever prepare meat. And by the way, after this course, you probably will never look at your food the same way again. Um, I, I always tell my students that they will probably, unless they're vegetarian, in which case they probably won't care. Um, but yeah, so tendons are very difficult to cut through. Okay? They're very, very tough tissues. Okay? They're very densely packed. And because of how densely packed they are, quite often around them, they will actually have a very loose connective tissue outer covering called a tendon sheath. Which will be much more loose, uh, for much more diffusion. That's where you will have blood vessels because you can't squeeze in blood vessels in between these bundles. Okay? So in tendons and ligaments, you will have an external blood supply. This is why you have small bundles of tendons surrounded by a tendon sheath, then more tendons after that. Okay? So we'll stop here and pick it up with cartilage and bone next week.